Thank you for joining us for CBN News. Watch him from Graham ahead today. The political battle over inflation heating up in Washington. West Virginia Senator Joe Manchin defends his deal for a new Democratic taxing and spending bill. Let me just say that this is all about fighting inflation. That's what it's about. But independent analysts disagree and Republicans say it will make things worse. The devastating flooding in Kentucky with the death toll rising and homes being wiped out. I had my whole life saved and saved in him. Oh, man. I ain't got nothing. We take a look at the destruction brought by these historic floods. Nearly 20,000 Russian Jews have immigrated to Israel since Vladimir Putin invaded Ukraine. But now Russian Jews may no longer be able to go to Israel. And CBN's Orphan's Promise on the scene in Ukraine, providing shelter for Ukrainians after Russia invaded. We saw them approaching from our basement through a crack in the window. We'll show you Orphan's Promise's work on the scene and tell you about the danger these workers face as they help so many in Ukraine. All those stories and more coming up next from the CBN Newsroom. This is CBN News Watch. We began in Washington, where Democratic Senator Joe Manchin went on all five Sunday news shows yesterday to defend his deal with Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer on a massive new tax and spending plan. But Republicans are disagreeing with his contention the bill will bring down inflation. This is all about fighting inflation. That's what it's about. Inflation is just absolutely destroying families across West Virginia and across America. High price of gasoline just to go to work, high price of food just to maintain your, uh, sustain yourself during the day and, and every day for your family, and then the high cost of energy and any and everything else you want to do in life is taking a tremendous toll. A new analysis from the Wharton School of Business at the University of Pennsylvania suggests the Democratic bill won't really do anything to fight inflation. Their report said their estimates were showed that the bill's impact was, quote, statistically indistinguishable from zero. Democrats hope to move the bill through the Senate quickly, although there are still questions about whether Arizona Democratic Senator Kirsten Sinema will support the measure. Turning now to Kentucky, the death toll from the devastating flooding stood at 28 as the day began, including four children. And even more rain is hampering rescue efforts. Aldea Hurd is on this story. Search and rescue operations are ongoing in eastern Kentucky, where dozens are still missing from devastating floods. And the number of dead could rise significantly. Parts of eastern Kentucky received between 8 and 10 and a half inches of rain in just 48 hours, creating flash flooding that swept away what little some people had, their homes. I had my whole life saved and saved in him. Man. I ain't got nothing. It took about five minutes for that to happen, five to six minutes, and it was gone from the time I got out of the house. It wiped out areas where people didn't have that much to begin with. Kentucky Governor Donald Bashir told NBC's Meet the Press the final death toll will not be known for some time. And we know it's going to grow. With the level of water, uh, we're going to be finding bodies for weeks. Many of them swept hundreds of yards, maybe quarter mile plus from where they were uh, lost. Damage to roads and bridges and even more heavy rain Sunday hampered rescue efforts. The National Guard says it used helicopters to rescue more than 400. This was something that didn't concentrate itself. A tornado has a path. It hits that swath and it's gone. This hit the entirety of the county. From one end to the other, it hit everything. Blistering heat and humidity is expected in the days to come. Shelters have opened to hundreds of homeless. The White House has declared a federal disaster to free up direct relief money to more than a dozen Kentucky counties. Operation Blessing has already delivered pallets of water and Home Depot disaster relief kits to several churches in the area and is continuing its relief operations as needs grow. The flood also extended into West Virginia and the southwestern region of Virginia. One father who found his daughter after she floated to safety on a rooftop said, We lost everything today, everything except what matters most. Dale Hurd, CBN News. 
Healthcare workers fired for not getting a COVID shot have won a major victory. The Liberty Council announced an historic $10.3 million settlement in the nation's first of its kind class-wide lawsuit. The class action settlement against North Shore University Health System is on behalf of more than 500 current and former healthcare workers who were unlawfully discriminated against and denied religious exemptions from the COVID shot mandate. That is according to the nonprofit religious rights law firm. The settlement was filed Friday in the federal Northern District Court of Illinois. The court has to approve the settlement. You can find the full story at CBNNews.com. Want to turn now overseas. Russia's ongoing war against Ukraine is resulting in Moscow putting pressure on Israel. As CBN Middle East correspondent Julie Stahl shows us, it could possibly stop Russian Jews from immigrating to Israel. In a Moscow court on Thursday, Russia's Justice Ministry moved to ban operations of the Jewish agency. While foreign organizations have faced increasing pressure in Russia for years, threats recently ramped up. For the last eight years since Russia started its uh, war against Ukraine, when they occupied Crimea, they were demanding that they stop collecting information about citizens of Russia and transferring it to the West. But of course, for Jewish agency, it's a ridiculous demand because that's exactly what Jewish agency is doing. The Jewish agency is responsible for worldwide immigration to Israel. Former chairman Natan Sharansky, a Russian Jew and human rights advocate, helped clear the way for the exodus of two million Soviet Jews starting in 1986. We should not be desperate. At the same time, I'm warning all our friends in Russia and Ukraine those who are seriously thinking about Aliyah should better do it as quickly as possible because situation is worsening very quickly. Nearly 20,000 Russian Jews have immigrated to Israel since the invasion started, along with some 16,000 Ukrainian Jews. And there are another 20,000 in the pipeline. My estimation is that approximately three times more Jews will come from Russia than from Ukraine. In Russia, he says, citizens are losing freedoms at such a rate, it's a reminder of communist Soviet rule. Wow. When I was sentenced for high treason, exactly in what Jewish agency is accused now. The only freedom which is still left is freedom of immigration. And who knows how long it will exist. That's why Jews who are concerned, they are finding themselves in fear society, in closed society, they're in a hurry to leave. Pincus Goldschmidt, who served as chief rabbi of Moscow, couldn't return from a trip because he didn't support the war in Ukraine. He's now in exile. These are complicated times and uh, the many dark clouds on the, on the horizon, also for the Jewish community. And this has been reflected in a great exodus of members of the Jewish community who have left Russia since the beginning of the war. Svetlana and her husband made Aliyah from Russia two months ago. We've hidden her identity to protect her family in Russia. We are very happy with that we made this decision. The political tension is rising and uh, the activity of Sakhnot is apparently being questioned at the moment by Russian authorities. Uh, not a lot of people can actually leave. Rabbi Goldschmidt says tens of thousands more Jews in Moscow with Israeli citizenship simply left. He expects the trend to continue. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Jerusalem. Coming up, CBN's orphan promise in Ukraine helping refugees hundreds of miles from home. And in some cases, they haven't known if those homes were still standing. We're going to take you inside a shelter that's helping these evacuees and tell you about the dangers orphans promise workers face in Ukraine. We've got the story for you when we come back.
Eight out of 10 members of a group of orphans promise aid workers, volunteers and refugees who were captured by Russian forces in Berndask, Ukraine last week have been set free. The CBN Family of Ministries had been praying for their survival and release and those prayers have been quickly answered in this case. Although the Russian troops did brutalize the hostages, leaving one hospitalized and others seriously injured. Two people who tried to evacuate are still being held captive. All the others were volunteers and were released, but they are not allowed to leave Berndask, so they are still in the occupied territory. You can find the full story at CBNNews.com. Orphan's Promise is ministering to the victims of the war in cities throughout Ukraine, including a haven where many refugees are finding shelter and comfort on their journey out of the country. George Thomas brings us that story. Vitalina Zinotka says she'll never forget the day Russian soldiers first appeared on her street. We saw them approaching from our basement through a crack in the window. Zinotka, her husband, two sons and mother are from Ukraine's southern city of Kherson. On March 11th, nine days after seizing control of Kherson, Russian troops started fanning out to outlying villages like Zinotka's. They came into our house with their machine guns and they didn't even bother to take their shoes off. Zenotka told CBN News that the men were drunk and started intimidating her husband and 18-year-old son. I felt like my heart was being squeezed. It felt like my soul was being squeezed. And it was even very hard to breathe because I was so fearful. She slipped into an adjacent room where her mother and 13-year-old son were and whispered to them to pray. I told my mom to pray that God would rescue us. The Russians demanded to see their passports. They were looking at our documents and trying to make sense of them, but they couldn't because they were drunk. Zenorka says their desperate prayers were suddenly answered. They were still walking around the house, pointing their guns at us, and praise God, they just left. Zenorka and her husband escaped this past Saturday under heavy fire as Ukrainian forces attempted to retake her son. They headed west from Kherson to Ternopol, where CBN's Orphans Promise runs this training center for children, now converted to house fleeing refugees. We are truly thankful for them hosting us. It's very comfortable. It's a very warm atmosphere. We were fed well. It's an amazing work that they are doing. The staff at Ternopol Training Center began gathering supplies within hours of war erupting. It started with us bringing our own mattresses from home. We had six to start with and were ready to host 10 people. The next day we received more mattresses and we were ready to host another 35 refugees. Ofen's Promise bought this two-story building in 2014 with the goal of reaching children and their families with the gospel. They would hold English classes Monday through Thursday and teach Bible lessons using CBN Superbook on Friday. Some 230 children and young adults showed up every week. We would teach them about God's law and the meaning of Christ's coming and resurrection. War has the students now taking classes online. Staff members also hold regular online prayer meetings and counseling sessions when needed. The fact that we can continue these lessons online brings peace to both us and them. As refugees poured in, neighbors who lived around the Orphan's Promise Center started pitching in. Some cooked, others brought supplies. Parents with children at the center also got involved. We united in the cause of helping people, serving people because they have needs. The city of Ternopol here in the western part of Ukraine has been sort of a rest stop for those who are making their way out of the country. And according to the latest statistics from the center, they say that close to about 600 people have passed through their doors since the start of the war. The majority of those, like 17-year-old Anastasia, staying at the Orphan's Promise Center for a night or two. She fled from Sumy, northeast of Kyiv, where Ukrainian forces are launching fierce counterattacks against Russian forces. I hope I will wake up from this nightmare soon and it will be all over. Zenorka's family heads further west in the morning to stay with friends. Staying here is an example of how Ukraine has become one family. Yet there's no place she'd rather be than home.
I really want to go back, but I'm afraid. It would be very painful because everything is destroyed and I don't know if I can handle that right now. George Thomas, CBN News, Ternopol, Ukraine. And you can find out more about what Orphan's Promise is doing in Ukraine and around the world by going to orphanspromise.org. Still ahead, punched between the eyes and nearly knocked out. This man suffered endless abuse as a child at an indigenous boarding school and not in Canada where it's been such a controversy. It happened right here in the United States. His story when we come back. Pope Francis wrapped his week-long visit to Canada Friday. While he was there, he apologized for the church's treatment of the native population over the past two centuries. More than 150,000 children were taken from their families. They were sent to church-run boarding schools where many suffered abuse. The same thing happened right here in the United States. Mark Martin brings us that story from Montana. When he was a child, Blackfeet Nation member Wes Bremner attended the Cutbank Boarding School in northwestern Montana. As a second grader in the 60s, distance and harsh winters made it a necessity. The school environment proved harsh as well. Bremner says physical abuse started on day one when a staff member punched him. He thumped me right between the eyes and almost knocked me out. And I went against the wall. Kind of wobbly on my feet, and uh, he said, "Now you go to bed." And it was about this time of day. Brimner is just one of many students who say they endured harsh corporal punishment and demeaning verbal abuse at Indigenous boarding schools, and some came forward years later with allegations of sexual abuse. We asked Brimner if that ever happened to him. If I was, I would take it to my grave. And why is that again? It's not something you would, uh, it's nobody's business. The boarding school where Bremner attended is still operational today. He says it's better run and the abuse that took place when he was a student is unheard of. On the Flathead Reservation in Montana, indigenous boarding schools existed alongside St. Ignatius Mission. The Jesuit priest and pastor, Father Craig Hightower, says abuse happened at these schools as well. There was some sexual abuse, there's no question about it, um, and that's already been litigated in court. Uh, the majority of the abuses were uh, trying to take away their culture, uh, trying to assimilate them into the white world, uh, and the corporal punishment of the day. I mean, just the corporal punishment that was common at that time. All that is left of the original Ursuline Academy are the remains of this grotto that held a statue of Mary. Children ages preschool to high school gathered in a building that once stood on this property. Was it worse with the priests and the nuns? Maybe, maybe not, but that, those were the big controversies of, uh, of kids, you know, really being be beaten and things like that. Uh, unfortunately, that was part of the culture overall. According to the National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition, more than 350 U.S. government-funded and many times church-run boarding schools operated in the 19th and 20th centuries. The movement started under the Indian Civilization Act of 1819 with the goal of assimilating indigenous children. Bremner says his mother was one of thousands of kids taken from their communities. He says at her school, there was a sign that read, kill the culture, save the child. Montana State Representative Sharon Stewart Paragoy says while Crow tribe children weren't forcibly taken, the goal remained the same. Children weren't allowed to speak the language. Um, that was, and um, part of it was the hair was cut, especially with the boys uh, and the girls, their, their hair was cut, and then they were forced to move into the the modern dress. The 2021 discovery of more than 200 unmarked graves at an Indian boarding school in Canada led Deb Holland, the U.S. Secretary of the Interior, to launch a national investigation, the Federal Indian Boarding School Initiative. Holland, the first Native American cabinet secretary, says her eight-year-old grandparents were taken from their families. She hopes the investigation will shed light on the unspoken traumas of the past. A lot of them died 
Some of them probably died from broken hearts, and a lot of them just died from being in close contact a disease that they couldn't get rid of because everybody was crammed in together. And so what we want for our children is to help them to get to reconnect to who they are and to be strong and, and to have thriving nations. That's what we hope um, Deb Howland will be able to do, is to change the policy, educational policy, to provide empowerment. It's no strange thing for Native American communities not to trust the government, but um, to, to be able to create and to heal bonds within Native American communities and county governments, state governments, and the federal government, and um, to have that conversation so that we can move forward. Mark Martin, CBN News, Montana. We'll be back with an encouraging word for your day ahead right after this. It is time now for your Monday motivation. Here's a thought to remember. It is better to seek the provider and not just the provision. Being close to the source is always being be is better than being close to the supply. In short, God provides blessings, but chasing him, getting close to him, spending time with him is better than any gift or supply that he provides. That is going to do it for this edition of CBN News Watch. You can always find more of our programs on the CBN News Channel. You can find them there at any time as well as online. CBNNews.com. We'd love to know what you think about the stories you've seen here today. You can email us. That address is right there at the bottom of your screen. It's newswatch at CBN.com. And of course, you can always reach out and touch us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We certainly would love to hear from you. I encourage you to make today a marvelous Monday and join us right back here same time tomorrow for another edition of CBN News Watch. Goodbye and God bless.